Okay, settle down, Rob. We're not even one-fifth into this season. Considering the monumental failures we have seen from the Canucks the past several seasons, can you really call them a contender, you big dummy? But here's the thing, am I really a big dummy for thinking so? <laughs> In the past several seasons, the Vancouver Canucks have set NHL records for all the wrong reasons. Back in 2011, Steven Samkos would set the NHL record with an unprecedented 0.21 crossbars per game. And if those shots went in, it would equal to an additional 17 goals. Whereas Elias Pettersson back in 2021, and get this, would average an astonishing 0.36 crossbars per game, which throughout an 82 game season would be an additional 30 goals. So whether it's terrible injury luck, losing Thatcher Demko for most of last season, which led to the Canucks having two AHL goalies in net, or perhaps the injury of Elias Pettersson, which would lead to his confidence deflating. The Vancouver Canucks luck has been horrendous. Now consider this, last season, we would see the Canucks set an additional two records. The first one being the most blown multi-goal leads to start a season, which would lead to the most blown multi-goal leads halfway through the season. But here's the thing, when it comes to good and bad puck luck, specifically on puck bounces, this is something you can control. And for Vancouver in the past several seasons, they have been on the shortest possible end of that stick. However, sometimes all of that bad luck culminates and this happens. Drops off, Hughes. In front, tip down with Cam. Takes a pass from Hughes. He shoots. Knocked down. Besser scores. Patterson. And that puck trickles into the net. Brock Besser. Pat trick. Four six for the Canucks. Rogers Reed. And he fell down. And he's through. Cuts down the board. Shoots. Land to the same. Puck to Fox in. Oh, he's off uh, Lafferty's helmet. That's the way to use your head. Maybe the hockey gods are finally rewarding the Vancouver Canucks for their horrible puck luck. So far this season, luck is on the Canucks side. Last season, Quinn Hughes would go 29 games without a goal. And this season has scored half his goals on absurd bounces. You can't make this stuff up. Like I've gone over my past several videos, the NHL is a copycat league. Teams study the roster construction of championship caliber teams, or perhaps finals runs, and re-envision their success with their existing roster. So with that being said, how does Vancouver's roster compare? Back in 2021, we would see one of the most incredible runs in NHL history. And no, I'm not talking about Tampa, I'm talking about Carey Price. As Carey Price that playoffs stood on his damn head, as he would take a borderline playoff team to Game 5 of the Stanley Cup Finals, as Price would set a modern day precedent, and that in our current game, a goalie still has the ability to be the single factor in a cup run, and in Vancouver's case, they have a Thatcher Demko. After being injured majority of last season, it's safe to say that Demko has returned to form. Hell, as I'm recording this video, Demko is leading all starters in goals against average, save percentage, shutouts, and most importantly, wins. But here's the thing, regular season stats are one thing, as we've seen goalies crumble when it comes playoff time. But... Goes, cross for top, get a club stop there by Demko. He'll move down, a short-hand, a chance here, and Demko has to make a good stop up. Riley Smith got past Hughes, and Smith down the ice, he beats Pedersen to the net, and again, it's Demko with a stop, and the line, Theodore, Burch again, Chase Theodore, and Demko down to make that stop, Demko still down, look out, Mark Stone with the break, here's Stone in short-handed, and Thatcher Demko with another stop, trying to make the pass, finds it, not from a great, win. Alex tucked to the front of the net, Stasny tied up, backhand, Demko, rebound, and Wob. From first to throw this puck down in there, and the battle ensues in front of the net. Stasny with a couple pretty good whacks at it, what a glove hand save. For Quinn Hughes, who made quite an impression, look at Stone. Back in the bubble cup run, Demko would finish that playoffs with, and I'm, I'm not even joking, a record setting .985 save percentage, and a .64 goals against average. 
No, I'm not saying 1.64 goals against, which would be, you know, impressive in itself. He would have a 0.64, as he would carry Vancouver on his back to Game 7 of the semi-finals, on a Canucks team that was nowhere near as good as the team we see today, which was very reminiscent to the Carey Price performance we saw back in 2021. What Demko did in the Bubble Cup run makes me very confident in his ability to dominate in crunch time. And a saying that I think helps represent the difference between a good goalie and a great goalie is that good goalies will make the saves they're supposed to make. Whereas a great goalie will make the saves they shouldn't be making. Demko is the embodiment of this saying. But what's interesting, yes having an elite starting goalie is a massive upper hand. But based on the runs we saw from Vegas and Colorado, it isn't necessary. But it does help compensate for a lack of defense as Aiden Hill and Kemper were really good, don't get me wrong, but in no means were they the driving force. The Avalanche would compensate from their high-end offense, and Vegas would dominate through a combination of depth and strict structure. Okay, so what about the offense? If we look at the regular season from the last three Stanley Cup champions, we can see an offensive trend, as each team had at least 11 players who scored 10 goals, 4 20-goal scores, and on average, one player who put up 30 goals. With Vegas being the exception, which once again highlights their unbelievable depth. And as it stands for Vancouver, based on previous totals and what we have seen from this small sample size, the Canucks are in pace for 14 10 goal scorers, 5 20 goal scorers, and 4 30 goal scorers. Relative to past champions, they are on pace to surpass them in all three categories. Again, this is just a projection, but based on past production, it shouldn't be too far off. But depth scoring isn't the only important factor, as each of the last five Stanley Cup champions have all had that high-end superstar. For Vegas, it was Eichel, McKinnon, Point, and Kucherov. And for Vancouver, they also checked that box. Because as it stands, Elias Pedersen is first in points and has been developing that two-way Selkie caliber game. Not to mention that Pedersen has already proven to be a clutch playoff performer, as he would dominate the SHL playoffs as a teenager, winning playoff MVP, and he would show up big time in his first and only run with the Canucks. And if the Canucks make the playoffs, you'd have to think he places top three in hard voting, a factor in JT Miller, who is somehow an underrated near 100 point player. All of this equals the fact that the Canucks check off the box for their much improved offensive depth, as well as high-end superstars. And the last factor is defense. Defense wins cups, even if you have the two best players in the world. Without defense, you have no chance. But not only do you need depth, but you need that number one defenseman. And if it wasn't clear enough from past seasons, Quinn Hughes has broken out this season as not only an undisputed number one defenseman, but if the season ended today, he would take home the Norris and maybe even the Hart, as Quinn Hughes has revolutionized a sorry Canucks blue line due to his gifted skating and ability to quarterback plays on any given shift. But what about his defense, Rob? The guy is tiny and is useless on the defensive end. This sentiment sums up a lot of people's opinion on Quinn Hughes. Now don't get me wrong, having a 6'6 six six defenseman who can play physically while driving the offense is a game breaker. And if you watch Canucks games, there are definitely plays where Hughes' size limits his ability to shut down certain plays. But here's the thing, what makes a defenseman who can shut down plays valuable? The ability to cause turnovers, break up plays, and shut down the opposition. Therefore, what makes a defenseman valuable is his ability to shut down plays. So I'll ask you this, whether it's breaking up plays through physicality or breaking up plays through the use of stick work, if at the end of the day, both plays are stopped, is size really the deciding factor? As there's been an ongoing comparison between Quinn Hughes and Kale McCarr. And for good reason, as they're both dynamic, puck-moving defensemen who came into the league at the same time. But people tend to point out that McCarr is far better defensively. But is that even true? If we take a look at last season and this season, 
Quint Hughes has outperformed McCarr in terms of defensive analytics. Keep in mind that Quint Hughes up until this season has been playing with 6 if not 7th defensemen, so the fact that he's been a positive on the defensive end has been a miracle. And now that he's playing minutes with Philip Hironik, his defensive game has risen to a new level. With that being said, having a number 1 D-man is a great thing, but the Canucks still lack in terms of overall defensive depth. Hironik, Cole, and Susie have been great additions, but relative Relative to other blue lines, the Canucks are still dependent on the performance of Demko to keep the puck out of the net. With that being said, the blue line isn't terrible, it's solid, and if they're able to add another legitimate right-handed shot defenseman, it would really help round out their roster. Now keep in mind, the Canucks also have two of the top right-handed shot defensemen prospects, and if they can become top four defensemen down the road, this will prove to be massive for the future of this team. So overall, I would give their goaltending a 9.5, their offense a 9.25, their defense a 7, and star power a 9. So according to the championship recipe, the Canucks check off 5 of the 6 boxes. Before Rick Tockett took over as head coach, the Vancouver Canucks were playing constant, high event hockey. Yes, Bruce Boudreaux was fantastic in his ability to get Elias Pettersson back on track, but defensive systems were horrendous. Yes, scoring is great, but if you can't keep the puck out of the net, it doesn't matter come playoff time. And the best impact a coach can have is the ability to understand how your roster operates and ticks. And with that, the implementation of systems that will ensure defensive success while at the same time allowing offensive systems that lead to scoring chances. This is a struggle we are seeing with teams like the Leafs and Edmonton Oilers, as this balance can be very hard to find, which is why coach firings have become so common. Back in Tockett's glory days, the man was the embodiment of a pure hockey player, as not only was he a big game scorer, but he was throwing massive hits, relentless on pucks and would cripple the opposition due to his physicality. More importantly, the man also played with all-time greats, and knows what it takes to win from a player and coach's perspective. So when your team is constantly having lapses in their focus, having a guy like Rick Tockett, who is a great speaker, he understands and motivates his players, which ultimately garners the respect of the room, players put in 110% in every shift. And with this effort, it's the only way you can reach the potential of your roster. The Canucks have been falling short of their potential for so many years, I've lost count. And it's no coincidence that Rick Tockett's presence has brought these results. Here's the Canucks record in pace before Tockett, and here's their pace with Tockett. Without him, they are a bottom team. With them, they're placing top 3 in the conference. Factor in the addition of Adam Foote, who has proved instrumental on the penalty kill, as their PK would go from the bottom to the middle of the pack with room to grow. The additions of Sergei Gonchar and the involvement of the Sedins has really helped their power play. Now, they weren't struggling in the past, but their presence and then Vancouver's higher success rate is not a coincidence, as the Rick Tockett effect has led to the entire roster buying into the process and was the missing key to this young Canucks roster. common frustration with the Canucks was their unwillingness to commit to the rebuild. Yes, they have had some high-end draft picks, but with their constant need to add through trade and free agency, would make them a tweener team. Not bad enough to finish with the top three pick, but not good enough to make the playoffs. Because here's the thing, the reason why committing to a rebuild leads to higher success rates, the ability to sustain that success, is because a top three draft pick is where you're adding those franchise cornerstone pieces. And outside the top three, we typically see a significant drop. With that being said, even though the Canucks in this era would never end up with a top three pick, they were able to draft franchise players in each pivotal position. So ultimately, even though they never committed, they did still end up with key building block players. And the unnecessary acquisitions would end up only delaying the process. But it's been delayed for quite a while, and I think that delay culminated to this season. Because my god, I'm gonna say it here, quote me later, the Vancouver Canucks are going to make the playoffs. And if Demko can play anything like he did in the bubble run, the Vancouver Canucks are a legitimate threat. And going forward, slowly adding through prospects developing in the system, and a few key signings and trades can take this team to the next level.
where they can compete against a team like Vegas and Colorado. But what do you think? Are the Canucks finally over the hump? Or is this season way too good to be true? The guaranteed Canucks auto packs are still in stock? Or you're chasing some beautiful Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes rookie autos? And as always, thanks for watching.